Hey all, welcome to Shattrek. This is Raj here and I'm back to making my regular videos. It is Friday uh, around 7 p.m. and this is my first video shoot for the day. Uh, I'm really happy to talk about this topic and bring to the attention of all genomic investors what you have to keep in mind uh, in the coming months uh, because our uh, sickle cell disease, uh, XSL and lower cell are going to be in the market very soon. And there are some significant developments happening in the field of CRISPR-Cas9. And that's the topic of today, and it relates to CRISPR therapeutics. So all of us uh, genomic investors need to watch this video till the very end, because I've got a lot of information out here, which is potentially likely to become the major story going forward into the first quarter of 2024. So with that said, let's get started. <music> Welcome back friends. I'm here to share a significant development that we are waiting for and you already know that recently the United Kingdom approved the world's first CRISPR based gene editing therapy called CASGEVI. We used to know it very early as CTX001, our oldest viewers will know that name and then more recently it became Exacel and now it's called CASGEVI developed by Vertex Pharmaceuticals and CRISPR Therapeutics. And we now have news that Vertex has chosen its longtime manufacturing partner, Lo Rosalind CT, to handle the commercial uh, production of Casgevy globally. An interesting bit of information for our uh, uh, community here is that Rosalind CT is very famous for cloning Dolly the Sheep in 1996. The company has received a manufacturer's authorization license for commercial production of cell therapies. And Casgevy approved to treat severe uh, form of uh, sickle cell disease and transfusion dependent beta thalassemia could potentially benefit up to 2,000 patients in the UK. Most of our channel viewers know this, but for the first time viewers, I'm just going to give you an overview of how Casgevy will work. The manufacturing process of Casgevy will involve drawing blood from the patient, extracting bone marrow stem cells at uh, Roslyn City's facility in Scotland correcting the faulty genes through gene editing, uh, freezing the product, conducting testing, adequate testing to make sure the quality is perfect, and then finally delivering the personalized Casgevy dose back into the arms of the patient anywhere in UK from where it had been taken. So that's the remit uh, for Roslyn CT. And uh, based on what I have read about Roslyn City, the collaboration is the result of a seven-year journey with CRISPR Therapeutics, uh, marking a pivotal moment for Roslyn City, specialized in the production of cell and gene therapies. And the company has grown substantially over the past five years and now has two manufacturing facilities, one in Edinburgh, Scotland, which I believe is going to serve entire UK, and the other in the outskirts of Boston with the capability to deliver Casgevy worldwide. So right now it seems that the plan for worldwide is to ship from Boston. So that's a huge logistic overhead, uh, even within the United States and even from Canada for that matter, right? From the other coast to Boston, it's going to take around eight hours or something for flight. So uh, I'm thinking that the logistics is something that one would be a bit worried about uh, with regard to uh, a stem cell therapy or uh, gene therapy. So in summary, this uh, partnership between Vertex and Roslyn City represents a significant stride in the gene therapy, offering hope to patients with severe um, uh, sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia, and not only them, but also to patients of other genetic ailments who know that CRISPR-Cas9-based gene therapies are being developed for their conditions because this is the proof of concept that CRISPR-Cas9 can deliver. So stay, stay tuned here for more updates on this. However, now I'm going on to the business side of the things. What I'm looking for is information on how it will be delivered in Europe. Uh, so is Europe going to receive it from uh, Boston or is it going to receive it from Edinburgh and what's the impact of Brexit? on this uh, manufacturing uh, scenario. Um, so that's the, that's the question that I have, which I think will get answered in the Q, um, Q1 uh, 2024 um, uh, earnings release of CRISPR or Vertex, we'll find that out, if not before. 
and i think each jurisdiction jurisdiction will have its own manufacturing regulations and authorizations so roslyn city will have to comply to those things and set up in the appropriate place so that there's a good patient experience good outcome and quick turnover which is more optimum uh, for um, better outcomes another interesting thing uh, that investors have to keep an eye out is the license ownership of crispr cas9 when therapies start to monetize the rubber hits the road in terms of royalties on the underlying gene editing technology the intellectual property battle primarily involves two parties the broad institute slash mit and the university of california berkeley broad institute uh, along with my, uh, mit and uh, harvard university were granted the first crispr cas9 patent in the united states in 2014 This patent covered the use of CRISPR Cas9 in eukaryotic cells, and University of uh, California Berkeley uh, filed its own patent for the use of CRISPR Cas9 around the same time. And the Berkeley team, led by Dr. Jennifer Dudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, were credited with the initial invention, and they won the Nobel uh, Prize for it. The University of California filed a patent interference lawsuit against uh, Broad Institute in 2016. arguing that their uh, patent application was the first to describe the use of crispr cas9 in eukaryotic cells and the dispute revolved around the interpretation of first to invent patent system in the united states in 2017 the us P- uh, patent trial and appeal board which is also called as ptab ruled in favor of the broad institutes uh, stating that the patents did not interfere with those of university of california This decision was based on the belief that the Broad's patent claims were distinct enough from those of Berkeley. The legal battle continued, and in 2020, the U.S. Court of Appeals uh, for the Federal Circuit upheld the PTAB decision, stating that Broad's patents were valid. And then we have a situation where, right now, the way the status is, uh, is that Broad Institute has prevailed in the U.S. And uh, when it comes to uh, Europe, I think University of California is uh, successful in Europe. and broad has to challenge them out there so it's a kind of a mixed kind of a situation and now among all these things what i want to do is i want to take you to the page on broad institute's website which talks about their licensing policy i want you to have a look at that because very soon um, as soon as um, these uh, therapies hit the patient's arms uh, we are going to have companies like beam therapeutics and editas which hold patents from a broad institute and also doing uh, sickle cell therapy and uh, beta thalassemia therapy uh, they are going to have a conflict uh, because crispr cas9 has been used on those target genes so uh, do they have any recourse uh, would uh, holders of editas and beam shares uh, suffer or would they get a, a premium of some sort or royalty from crispr and vertex um, in the us and what happens in the europe is it the other way around when um, beam and uh, uh, editas start uh, selling their therapy in europe so those are the questions that are out there and i am expecting that as soon as the first patient is dosed the first lawsuit is likely to come in uh, earlier i thought that broad was going to be just forgiving and it would say come on let's forget and let's all be friends but i want to go to this page now in broad institute and you'll ex- uh, understand why well friends here we are in the page on broad institute's website which talks about uh, gene editing uh, technology licensing and it says for companies wishing to sell tools and reagents for genome editing we also license crispr ip non exclusively for human therapeutics we concluded that exclusivity is necessary to drive the level of investment needed to develop certain technologies to the point that they are safe effective and capable of precise editing in specific cell types so basically what they want to do is they want to make sure that if a, a, a gene therapy company license crispr cas9 uh, to tackle sickle cell disease they want that company to explain to them which gene they are going to edit and how that is going to cure sickle cell disease once they understood that the next thing they want from them is a plan of when they are going to start it how much money do they have to invest in it and by when they would have completed um, the 
necessary developments and when they would be uh, uh, the likely target date for getting it to the patient's arms. So that's what they are looking for. And they think, Broad Institute thinks, that unless exclusivity is given to a particular gene therapy company, the, that company won't be able to invest large amounts of money. Investors won't pour in money that is needed in order to do the research and come up with the therapy. Because if 10 uh, other companies are doing the same thing, uh, it becomes very unviable. So they decided that they are going to just look at unique uh, gene editing. So two companies may do sickle cell disease uh, related therapies, but as long as they are targeting different genes, they can still use CRISPR-Cas9 legally and be licensed for it from Broad Institute. So that's the approach Broad Institute took. And I think it was a very wise approach. I hadn't understood it clearly in my earlier readings, but this particular page makes it so clear. I'm going to read further. It says, Broad Institute, Harvard, and MIT therefore developed an approach that we call an inclusive innovation model. Under this model, Broad, Harvard, and MIT licensed CRISPR technology to a primary licensee. However, after an initial period, other companies may apply to license CRISPR IP use for, uh, for use against genes that are not being pursued by the primary licensee. So let us say Editas has identified a bunch of genes for sickle cell disease and they have got the license. Uh, they are supposed to finish it in a time-bound manner. But if some other company comes in and they want to talk about other uh, gene targets, then that's fine. And then it says specifically, a third party interested in, in an individual gene target would provide a bona fide development plan. The primary licensee then has a predefined period to announce that it is already working on the target or decide whether it intends to pursue the gene of interest and commit funding and launch a program. So the current licensee can't just say, um, yeah, I'm interested in it and then ask the other one to go away. No, if they are interested, then they have to commit funds and they have to give a plan of by when the therapy is going to be developed and delivered to the patients. And then it goes on to say, uh, if the primary licensee is not ready, not already working on the gene of interest and chooses not to launch a new program within this period, the IP may be available for licensing by Broad, Harvard, and MIT to a third party. And the goal of our inclusive innovation model is to enable the primary licensee to devote sufficient investment to develop CRISPR-based genome editing technology to treat human diseases while supporting broad development of medicines to reach many patients. So they not only want CRISPR-Cas9 to be used on multiple gene targets to target multiple uh, ailments, but also to reach many patients. And to enable such developments, the broad uh, Harvard and MIT also retain rights to access certain human therapeutic targets for internal development and future licensing. And then it says, Broad has licensed various therapeutic and diagnostic technologies under the inclusive innovation model to multiple companies, including Editas. So Editas is developing a SCD uh, and TDT uh, therapy, and then also to Beam Therapeutics, which is also developing uh, sickle cell disease uh, therapy. So I'm thinking that there's going to be a potential uh, legal clash, and all that cannot happen until the first patient is dosed, because that's when a breach of contract can happen. So the moment that happens, I think we'll see something um, uh, in the news, and that could occupy uh, most of 2024, but it'll be really heavy in the uh, Q1 2024 and Q2 2024 timeframe. That's when most of these things will start blowing up, in my opinion. Now, interestingly, when you look at Bluebird Bio, Bluebird Bio uses lentiviral vector to deliver copies of genes into cells. It doesn't use CRISPR-Cas9, so it has steered clear of this entire uh, problem. And in fact, they have licensed their lentivirus uh, vector uh, technology to Novartis. So I think Bluebird Bio now starts looking better, despite the fact that their balance sheet is weak. They'll get the priority review voucher, which will buy them another six to eight months of operation. And they already have Skysona, they have Zinteg uh, Zinteglo, and now they will have lower cell at the end of December with three gene therapies and a LVV uh, established LVV uh, pattern uh, where they have 15 years worth of um, records. 
uh, I think they are on a very strong wicket when it comes to sickle cell disease. So I'm holding on to my Bluebird bio shares. Um, so in conclusion, what I would say is that I'm happy uh, that CRISPR therapeutics and Ver Vertex have now reached a stage where they have signed up uh, a company, Roslyn CT, for manufacturing in a worldwide uh, through Boston plant and for UK in uh, Edinburgh. So that's a good development. Uh, I'm anxiously looking forward to the approval date, PADUFA date, for both exacel and lower cell, which is in the second and uh, I think which is in the third and fourth week of December. It could be part of our Santa Claus rally that I hope. And uh, I'm very optimistic for uh, Bluebird Bio because I think this will give it a shot in the arm. And uh, I think that uh, investors in CRISPR therapeutics will have to be very alert and watchful to make sure that there is no extra size of a license fee that goes away because that can reduce the margins mm -hmm. and that could also potentially increase the cost of the uh, therapy for CRISPR therapeutics and Vertex. So that's my two bits. Of course, this is not professional advice. What I'm saying may or may not happen, but this is a speculation. I just wanted to get it to you guys out there and it's equally important for me to hear back from you because many of you are seasoned investors who have been investing in gene therapies and many of you subscribe to various journals and other things and you probably know a lot more. I want to hear from you because I hold both CRISPR as well as Bluebird and um, your opinions and ideas will definitely help me as well as the entire community. So please do not hesitate to press the like on this uh, video so that it goes to as many investors as possible and also please comment. Thanks and have a great day. Bye for now.